Now Harry Arter. Harrison Reed to his right. Ben Watson in his way. It's Harry Arter again! Majestic! Magical! The goal of his dreams from Harry Arter. And after a false restart, Fulham are finding their rhythm now. The goal was dreams. Wow, wow, wow. 25 yards out, Harry Arter. That was a very important goal for Fulham about three weeks ago now against Nottingham Forest and has put them in part into the playoffs. They are up against Cardiff tomorrow. They have a two-goal lead in the Rock Craven Cottage tomorrow. Very happy to say Harry Arter, the man who scored that goal and who's been on the show multiple times, is with us again. Harry, thanks for the time. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks, guys. Yourself? Yeah, very well. Great to have you with us. I know you're injured at the moment. We might as well relive that goal for a second. It was a beauty. Yeah, it's one of those. You, they probably said it right in commentary. You, you know, as a as a midfielder and someone that doesn't score too many, um, you know, it's nice to just get on the score sheet anyway. But you know, it was an important game, uh, an important time of the season, and you know, I was I was really happy with the strike. So it was, it was a good night. Suddenly, I mean, the games keep coming, don't they? And the stakes get higher and higher. So you're in the midst of playoffs at the moment and it's Cardiff's second leg tomorrow. I know you're injured. Is it a bad injury or just a niggle or where are you? It's kind of probably in between a, a niggle and a, a more so bad injury. It's just that the timing's not great because of the, the quick turnaround. Um, you know, everyone's aware of the, the schedule that we've, we've had to have been faced, um, you know, post-coronavirus and... You know, it's been a big ask for, for every club to, you know, kind of deal with the situation and, and within that, you know, deal with the injuries. And unfortunately for me, it was only last week um, I picked up a, a little injury. And in normal, in normal circumstances, there's there's usually a, a break between the end of the season and the playoffs. And if there was a, you know, a two-week break, I, I would be fine. But, you know, it's going to be push and go. But fingers crossed I, I could make the final. It's been a weird season, obviously, by normal circumstances. How have you been going generally? We'll get, we'll get to lockdown in a second, but I know you've played 28 times this year, which is a decent size. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been a good season, one that you know, I've, I've really enjoyed. One, we're in a position now where you know, we're two games away from what our, our goal was at the start of the season. Um, of course, the, the manner of the season kind of you know, makes it you know, a completely different sort of feel to the season that you, that I'm used to. Um, you know, the break um, around March time, and then returning only you know a month or six weeks ago. It was a it's such a difficult you know season, and and you know from a physical side, trying to manage yourself, it, it's been difficult. And I just felt like I was getting a run of games, you know, up post uh, my injury that I had earlier in the season, and and it comes to a halt. So that part of it was disappointing, but. Um, the position we're in as, as a team is is one that you know we would have took at the start of the season and one that we're really looking forward to hopefully finishing on a high. I read you hit the roads and did lots of running during lockdown. Yeah, that probably um, that probably didn't help me to be honest because as footballers and all players would be aware, you know, the surfaces that we're used to at, at training grounds and, and games, you know, the, the pitches are like carpet, and I think your body kind of you know gets used to that sort of surface, and then you're out road running and you know your your body's not overly used to it, and you pick up little niggles. But that was that was a position every player faced herself in. You know, all mm. the gyms were shut, uh, training grounds were were off limits. So it was it was back to the real old school of, of road running and and just trying to you know keep yourself fit. What were you clocking up on a good day? Uh, the best I got up to was twelve kilometers, which for me, yeah, you know, gone are the days now where you know pre seasons about distance and. And doing them long slog runs, it's all short, sharp stuff. So I feel my era kind of missed that sort of pre-season phase. And I, I'm quite thankful for that, to be honest. <laughs> but it was quite nice to, you know, have a different sort of training. It was completely put on by, you know, the individuals, really. Um, there was no one monitoring it. So it was it was down to yourself. And, you know, I've never been really a long road runner, sort of. I've never really enjoyed that side. But I kind of got into it and I started to really enjoy it. Mm. you know the the road running and the long distance stuff it was it was something different and, and something i enjoyed why fulham this year as opposed to staying at bournemouth how does that decision happen uh do you know what it's when you're when you're on loan i said it last year when i was at cardiff you know i was asked the same question whether i was going to stay there and you know when i'm at a club and, and when i'm signed there and we've got a, a goal you know i don't really think about my future 
really. Um, you know, the teams um, and the clubs, end goal is much bigger than what, what for, what's going to happen for me, uh, to me next year. So I, I honestly haven't thought about it. It was disappointing Bournemouth got, got relegated. I was, you know, praying that perfect season would have been Fulham getting promoted and, and Bournemouth staying up. Um, but as of the minute, you know, I'm contracted to Bournemouth and so I've got a very good relationship with the club there. And mm. if it doesn't work out here at Fulham or it doesn't, you know, suit both parties, then there's, there's no problem going back to Bournemouth. And Harry, how does it work that you go out on loan again? At the end of your season on loan at Cardiff, do you go back to Bournemouth and chat with Eddie Howe and he says, listen, there might not be enough regular football for you, maybe you should go out on loan again? Or is it is it your suggestion? How do you arrive at the, at the decision after your year at Cardiff to go out on loan again? Well, I really enjoyed the year at Cardiff and, you know, it was out of my comfort zone for what I've been used to for, for eight years. Um, I think naturally the, the season that I had before Cardiff, it was it was quite obvious that, you know, I had to probably have a change of scenery for for all different reasons, really. Um, but from just a football side, it was something that I wanted to experience and something that I really enjoyed at, at Cardiff. Mm. Um, and to be honest, my my mindset was to to go back to, to Bournemouth and carry on my journey there. Um, I was more than happy to prepare to fight my way back into the team. Right. Um, but then, you know, the, the, this move come around and it's obvious that, you know, the attraction it being working under someone that I've looked up to and um, someone that's been in my life from such a young boy to, to be able to, uh, to be able to work under Scott and learn from him from a, um, from a football point of view was something that I really wanted to try. Um, at a club that, you know, had, you know, and still have got really strong ambitions to get in the Premier League. And to be part of that, I was really excited about. And, mm. um, it was kind of the only move that I probably would have made this summer um, based on what, you know, I had available to me. Um, and I made that clear to Bournemouth and, and Eddie, you know, totally got it. He understood and he thought it would be a great move for me and something that I'd really enjoy. Okay. This is Scott Parker, obviously, you're talking about. So he's an in-law, is that right? Yeah, he's married to uh, my sister. Okay. So you've known him a long time. Yeah, they've been they've been together since I can remember. To be honest, to say he's been a huge influence on my life. Um, you know, obviously seeing him grow up as uh, a model professional uh, when he was a player, mm. um, someone that achieved. You know, at a point of being a young boy, only I could dream of really. Um, so naturally, he was someone I always looked up to, and as I said, they're a model professional, which. Um, I didn't really have to ask much of him. It was more just look at how he lives his life, how he prepares for game, and mm. um, you know, I learned a lot of him growing up. Because he went to Chelsea, obviously he got that big move, and it's very easy at Chelsea when there's so many quality players to not make an absolutely massive impact. But you think back to the football he was playing, which got him that move. He was as good as any midfielder going in the league, and model professional is exactly the phrase I'd use to describe him as well. We, we can kind of us- underestimate how good a player he was. Well, yeah, I grew up probably being biased because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, you know, that's fair, that's I, a fair I enough. To see him, of course, I wanted to see him and always see him as, in my opinion, the best player whenever I watch. But um, obviously, I never got to work with him, never got to play with him as a, as a player. Uh, I could only appreciate it from, from afar. Um, so this season, you know, even when I come in here, he sometimes joining training. And <laughs> I don't know whether this is a massive compliment to him or it doesn't sound too good on the Fulham lads, but... He's by far, by far the best player in the little small sided games. And I always point out right. to him, I'm like, when you come in, you're like, you're the best player. And he, he, he takes it modestly and he, he says, if we got to a bigger pitch, he, he would soon struggle. But even in the in the small stuff and the little five sides, mm. his, his quality was, you know, top. And of course, he had a top career to back that up. So it's no surprise to me, really. Um, but no, he was, a, he was a top player and someone that, all the midfielders at Fulham, um, I've, I've definitely learned off and try and gain every information off him. Um, and he, he's there to help everyone. I would suspect you enjoy the football he's trying to play as well. It's very much possession-based. I think Fulham across the Championship have had the second highest percentage of possession and certainly attempt the most passes. On all the stats, it points to possession-based football. So I suspect that's right in your wheelhouse rather than trucking up and down the pitch with the ball going over your head. Yeah, he had a um, he had a clear philosophy and identity of how he wanted to become successful as a manager, and I'm always quite um, you know adverse to to saying one style works and one style doesn't. I think you know when you get it right, ball possession is without doubt 
the most prettiest and, and in my opinion, the best way to play football. But as a manager, I think you have to, you know, identify what your team's strengths are. Um, you know, I look at Cardiff as an example. Last season when we went up and I joined there, it was, you know, obvious from the outset that we wasn't going to be such a, a, a possession-based team. Mm. And I, I genuinely believe that was the best um, best chance for us to stay up as a team. Mm. Um, if we would have went toe-to-toe with some of the teams in the league, um, you know, I'm, I know we ended up getting relegated, but I don't think it, we would have put up as much of a fight as we did. Um, and same here at Fulham. You know, it could have easily gone another way. Scott could have decided to go long ball, but he, he looked at the players we've got. Um, the technical side of our team is, is very high. And it would definitely suits the style of players that we got. So I think, you know, the style is important, but it's more based on what your your individuals that you've got in your team are suited to. When will you decide on your future? I, I, I presume in some ways it's dependent on Bournemouth. It's dependent on whether Fulham get up to the Premier League or not. So there's a lot of ifs, buts and maybes there. Do you have any idea what will happen next season just yet? No, honestly, I, ha- I haven't got a clue. The the, the deal initially was um, I had to make uh, 30 starts for Fulham and if they got promoted, there was some sort of automatic um, uh, deal triggered. But that obviously isn't going to happen now um, just through the lack of starts. So it would be, you know, a, a decision that's out of my hands. Um, one that, you know, I think the business side of football this summer is going to be uh, a lot lower than it has been in previous years mm. for obvious reasons. And, how quick the turnaround is from, you know, the season ended, and especially us being in the playoffs to, you know, the start date of pre-season. I think we're looking at the 17th or the 20th of August, which, you know, is literally two weeks um, from from when we finish. So I think anyone involved in the transfer, they know nine times out of ten, it, it, it takes more than a week, two weeks, three weeks. So as a as an individual, I'm just trying to, you know, detach myself from from that situation. I feel lucky I've got, you know, a contract, you know, at Bournemouth that I can go back to. I'm not worried about that side of things, which, you know, sadly, a lot of players are going to be in a position this year where, you know, they haven't got a contract. And mm. as I said there, the, the financial implications of, of what coronavirus has done is going to, you know, really hit a lot of people hard. So I'm not I'm not thinking selfishly at all. It's, it's more just I want to try and play a part in Fulham going up and, and then taking it from there. And how's your game? How's your form? How are you feeling about things? Yeah, it's it's so difficult when you're injured because, especially with games so quick, and you, and you you feel like there's probably um, not a good chance of of being a hundred percent fit, especially for tomorrow night. There's obviously no way I'm not in the squad, and it's kind of just trying to get my head around, hoping and 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 working hard to be available for the final. So it's kind of it is difficult because every player wants to be playing. It's, it's the worst part of being a footballer when you're injured. And I feel fortunate it's only a, a little sort of injury compared to some of the injuries you can get. So I'm, I'm, I'm staying positive and hoping the lads can can obviously do it on Thursday. And mm. I've been pleased with been pleased with the last, you know, six or seven games. Right. Um, we hit a real good bit of form as a team and it's always good to be part of a team that's, that's winning. Irish fans will obviously want to know, are we going to be seeing you again anytime soon? Stephen Kenny name-checked you. Recently, he was doing a press conference over here as somebody that would be more than welcome back. And even that Nottingham Forest goal that we played, Keith Andrews was actually on co-commentary that day. So that was a handy game for him to catch. I presume you're keen to come back and get into an Irish shirt again down the line. Yeah, I've said it before, you know, playing for Ireland is, without doubt, one of my my greatest achievements as a a player. Um, You know, forget where the journey that I've, I've had to get to that, you know, even if I would have started off in the Premier League and, and was able to to play for Ireland at international um, senior level, it would have been something that I'd always dreamed of. So never would I close the door on it, um, especially not after speaking to to Stephen. Um, I think he he done the rounds with the players and spoke to you know the players that were involved with with Mick, and it was nice to to be involved in that. Um, he seemed keen to. You know, hopefully get me over um, fitness related and, and form related. Really, mm. um, he certainly made no promises about you know being in the squad, playing nothing like that. It was kind of to see where I was at, what kind of went wrong in the last year or so. Um, he totally understood where I was coming from, and, and as I say, he, the fact that he said it to you guys in the press, he only echoed that to me and, and said you know he'd like to me to come back over. So it was something I was really thankful for and, and without doubt excited about. 
Yeah, because remind me, had you been in much under Mick? Um, I was in the first squad, um, and I kind of just got the feel. And, and Mick was was honest. Mick was great. Um, you know, I think he had his mindset on you know the midfield that he was favourable to yeah. uh, if they were fit. Um, and I just felt you know I didn't want to go over to to make the numbers up. I remember the call with Mick. I, I kind of just said, "I'm always here. You know, if you need me, um, if you need me to play and be in the squad, I'm always going to be here. But if you feel like you know there isn't a chance of me playing, and you should put me in the squad because of I've been in it previously, and and you don't want to you know upset me in a way, um, then please don't do that. Look at the younger players that you know would love the experience of just travelling with the lads." Um, and especially just joining Fulham, you know, the season's so cramped in the championship. You have so many games. Right. Um, Mick totally understood that. He knew that I was on loan and I needed to try and, you know, help Fulham go up. Um, and, you know, we left it on good terms. He said, listen, if there's an injury, um, then I know I can call on you. And, you know, we was happy with that arrangement. OK, that's very interesting to hear because from afar, if I was to just put it in blunt terms, it, I, I suspect I wasn't the only one who had wondered this. There was the very high profile situation with Roy and that leaked out and that seemed very nasty and like no fun for you at all. And I just wondered if largely because of that and then maybe you felt you weren't mixed cup of tea, you had just thought, I'm kind of done here. This ain't happening. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to let my Irish career drift out to sea a bit. I'm not that, you know, it, it, it had sullied the thing for you. Well, I think the, 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 the last few years playing for Ireland has been, you know, a difficult one for me. Um, on the pitch, really, more than more than anything, I don't feel like I've I've given a, an account of myself that I come off the pitch entirely happy with. Um, a new manager coming in, um, I just sensed it that he, I wasn't someone that he see as first choice or even second or third or fourth. And mm. um, I'm sort of glad that when I went over there, I tried my hardest, trained well, and. It was more of a case of just having an honest chat with Mick, mm. um, you know. So it wasn't as it wasn't as a result of the previous issues with with Roy and all no, that stuff. no, definitely not. Because to be fair, the, the first game Mick played, he, he brought me on against Gibraltar, mm. um, um, and then we played Georgia. And he went to the free midfield, and I didn't play. And you know, them lads that played were brilliant throughout that campaign, Glenn, Connor, and Jeff. Mm. Um, and then we had some really good young lads coming through. I know Josh done really well. Um, in the in the friendlies, Alan Brown. So it wasn't even a case of, you know, me saying I don't want to be here because, you know, Mick, by all, you know, he could have easily not picked me based on form, based on his own decision. Um, and I just didn't want to. I kind of didn't want to put him in that position. Really, I, I felt he respected me a lot when I went over the first time, um, and I felt I owed him that respect that I wouldn't necessarily just want to go over to make the numbers up. Um, uh, being thirty years old now and. And being part of the island setup for the last six years, um, and more so just the amount of games there is in the championship, um, I just didn't want to just be that number or yeah. that person that Mick felt like he had to put in because I've been in the squad previously. And as I say, you know, he was great with great with me on the phone, um, and he knew I was always going to be there if needed. And um, I know he, oh, I like to think that he felt like he could count on me if if, if I did get a call. I, I, well, that's 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 same. Um... Good to hear, and it, it's a very honest thing of you to say that you feel you haven't given a good account of yourself in an Irish jersey. Any reason as to why, or things just haven't clicked on certain nights for you? Did you did you feel like you you did put in some performances you were very happy with in an Irish shirt down the years? I look back at my my early games, you know, friendlies, a few friendlies I've done well, um, the build up to the Euros, yeah. the one that I had to put out on. You know, I was really pleased with them performances and. Now, I've only played 15 times, so I've been involved for the last you know, six years now. So 15 times is, is not as many caps as I, I would like anyway, to be honest. Mm. Um, but I feel the latter part of, of, of Martin's reign, um, and there's no fault of anyone other than myself. I, I, I feel the older I've got, the more I've realised that as a player, you have to take full responsibility for, for your performance. Um, it's no good blaming anyone else. I'm the one who's out on the pitch. I'm the one who's been asked to deliver the goods. And if I don't do it, then it's no one's fault other than mine. So, um, you know, I take full responsibility for, you know, especially the last couple of years or maybe the last, you know, five or six games mm. under under mine. I wasn't happy with it at all. You know, 
whatever that could be. Obviously, me and Roy had the the alteration that was quite obvious and plain for everyone to see. Um, and was that did you did you re did you regard that as a big deal? I regarded it as a, a lack of respect, um, purely for no reason, to be honest. Um, you know, I, it's not something that I would like to go back onto, but you know, at the time it was uncalled for. I'm not the sort of lad that would ever um, fake an injury. And the the ironic thing about it was that it was in the middle of the summer. I could have been on. It was when we played France and USA, and it was in the middle of the off season. So, you know. I was thinking to myself, if I'm faking an injury, I wouldn't be sitting in a hotel. The last thing I want to be doing is sitting in a hotel, injured, when I'm in the middle of my summer. So um, it was just the, I guess it was a misunderstanding. Um, you know, Roy got it totally wrong um, with why he thought I was injured or maybe the injury itself. He didn't realise the extent of what it was. Um and I genuinely now put it down to misunderstanding. Right. Um, I know he's done a few interviews since, and he's name checked me and 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 Stephen Ward and and John Waters. But you know, it's something that I would never want to get involved in. It's it is what it is. I've always tried my hardest. Um, I wasn't prepared to let someone accuse me of faking an injury. And if you look at it from an obvious outset, if I'm faking an injury, I wouldn't be doing it in the off season when I could be on holiday. I would. Um, I certainly wouldn't be sitting in a hotel in Dublin. I would be on a beach somewhere enjoying the sun. So um, mm. I was disappointed with with that whole situation. But you know, for me, me and Roy spoke about it a good four or five months after, and to me, it was it was finished. Right. Okay. So you did speak and you did put it to bed. Yeah, we put it to bed. Yeah, I, I made it clear to my me and Roy hadn't spoke. Um, I didn't want to go home mid-trip. I was really disappointed with with, with being accused of that. Um, I decided just to not cause a fuss. Uh, I didn't want to storm out or anything like that. Um, so I stayed for the rest of the trip, um, even though I made it clear to Martin that I wasn't happy with it, out of respect to, to Martin more than anyone, to be honest. Um, I didn't want to just leave midway through um, the week before the game, so I decided to stay and... I kind of made a decision then that, you know, I need to take a time away from this. I, it was something I wasn't prepared to accept at the time. Mm. Um, and then eventually me and Roy got round to speaking and it was it was done. Right, OK. So you did you had a good relationship with Martin by the sounds of things? Yeah, I, you know, Martin gave me my, my debut um, when some managers easily wouldn't. I was only playing in the championship at the time, you know, off it. A good season with Bournemouth, of course, and, you know, I was really pleased with that year. Um but I was so thankful for for the opportunities he, he gave me. Um, some of our performances, as I said to you earlier, I don't feel was good enough, but I felt a real belief in Martin mm. um, towards me. Um, he put me in um, after performances that potentially some managers wouldn't. Um, put me in for probably one of the biggest games of my career um, against Wales. Um, and I'd like to feel I repaid him that night. And Going back to the Euros, you know, I would have been in... According, you know, speaking to Martin before that, I would have been in the squad. So, for him to have put that trust in me to put me in the squad, it was something I'd always respect, and um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed working with Martin. Yeah, it's the brutal side of football, isn't it? Like that you're putting in performances that you're not happy with yourself, and it's not for the lack of trying. Like I'd say, you're desperate more than anything to have a really good game and to play well, and you know, you couldn't be putting in any more effort, and it's just not going your way. That can be a tricky thing to try and figure out. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, you've got to deal with it. You know, you've got a lot of time to to assess your performances at international level because, you know, they only come round, you know, at best, you know, September, October and November. You know, that's obviously a month in between the games, but usually there's a there's a massive gap in between the games. So, you know, at club level, you can have a bad game and then, you know, three days later, you've got, a game to put it right, so it's it's more difficult with the international side. Um, but it's something that you know, international level was uh, a completely different experience to club level. So mm. something that potentially I have to, you know, grasp better and and try and assess better. And as I say, I always I've always given my all for Ireland. Um, always tried to be there 
you know, playing through, you know, injuries at times when potentially wasn't the right thing to do. Um, right, okay. But well, hopefully well, well, then I can see how you're a bit peeved when you're accused of being injured and, and or fake an injury. And look, that's even Roy himself didn't react well to being accused of that. Was that relationship generally okay? Was that, or was that an ongoing issue for you? Um, no, I didn't think there was, you know, any problems <laughs> with Roy until, until that trip. And then, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn because sure. I don't know whether Roy's just said he got the wrong end of the stick and, you know, sometimes he can go overboard. Um, whether he was just saying that just to, you know, get me back into the squad and, you know, all the media side stuff was, was closed on it. But, you know, he seemed um, genuine that, you know, he, he, he accepted that the, the situation he might have read wrong. Okay, um, fair enough. So, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to think that was put to bed. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And look, it's the world of football as well, a little bit. That's kind of, I'm sure it's not the first or last time someone's screamed at you in the last 15 years. No, exactly. And, you know, I've always, you know, from day to day, you, you have massive fallouts with, with players, with managers, you, and you put it to bed. Um, I just felt there was a line overstepped. And as a as a person, I was wasn't accept, wasn't willing to accept the situation I was put in. So that that was it from me. I just, as I say, managers have, have had a go at me before. Um, but I just felt it got too personal, and I wasn't ready to. I wasn't accepting it. Yeah, fair enough. Well, listen, that's a couple of years ago now. Hopefully, things go well for. Fulham tomorrow, you get the body back in order and, and maybe there's Premier League football or something on the horizon. Either way, we might see you around Ireland camp in the not-so-distant future, but for the time being, Harry, thanks for the time. Much appreciated. No worries. Thank you very much.